April 1912, RMS Titanic, the largest moving man-made object in the world, sets sail on her maiden voyage. April 2018, 21 students set out to immerse themselves in the final hours of that voyage and the era to which it belonged. Two nights separated by over a century. This is the story of two voyages, one in search of the other. In the spring of 2018, students from a unique school arrived at a repurposed elementary building in Colleyville, Texas to take part in a unique project. The project is an annual living history experience, each year in a different era, a different event. This year, the staff is gearing up to create an extravagant bygone era and place students aboard the infamous RMS Titanic in the last hours of her maiden voyage in 1912. These remarkable educators are taking on the roles of famous passengers and crew, preparing the elaborate final meal served on April 14th of 1912, and rebuilding the past in order to immerse these students in the waning days of the Edwardian age. As their Titanic was prepared, the students perused Titanic artifacts and went through hours of trainings and orientations on everything from the facts behind the doomed ship's encounter with an iceberg in the North Atlantic to how to properly carry on an Edwardian conversation. They are portraying 21 actual passengers aboard the Titanic and have spent weeks researching and prepping for this event. Such a well-known story. You know what's gonna happen and you know the ending and it's not you figuring out what's gonna play out, but of how you were gonna make it play out. Excited, nervous, the students don period costume and prepare to board the Titanic, wondering what the night would have in store for them. March 1909 the Harlan and Wolf shipyards in Belfast, Ireland. The second of what was to be three sister ships begins construction. When completed, the Royal Mail Steamer Titanic would be the largest man-made object afloat, larger even than her sister ship and predecessor Olympic. 882 and a half feet in length, she stood 175 feet from the keel to the top of her four funnels. She displaced over 45,000 tons. Within her would be nine decks, accommodating 3,300 passengers and crew. She and her sisters were meant to be the flagships of the White Star Line, sparing no expense when it came to luxurious appointments for her first-class passengers. From bow to stern, the Titanic was designed to be a ship of dreams. Teacher Lori Alsobrook researched the interiors of the actual ship and produce the environment students would see as they came aboard. From this rather ordinary elementary school cafeteria, also Brooke created a breathtaking facsimile of the first class smoking room. The Cafe Parisienne. And even the famous clock at the top of the grand staircase honor and glory crowning time. Seven thirty PM The traditional bugle call used aboard White Star Liners to signal dinner sounds, and students are led aboard. As a steward leads them from one century into the next, students become passengers and get their first glimpse at a Titan. As they are seated and the sounds of the Titanic's band, distantly audible from the first-class dining saloon, fills the air, 
they find themselves engaging in conversation as it would have been in Edwardian times. Furniture, and it is nice to be one of the first occupants, don't you agree? I think that, like, ability to empathize with other people that you've never known, they never will know, is really powerful in any field. And I think that can be applied to lots of different things, like even outside of academics. So. Conversation amongst passengers on the night of April 14, 1912, would have revolved around the issues of the day. No matter who is elected, it will be uh, favorable. It's an interesting parallel, you know, the story of America starting out and breaking off from the United Kingdom as well. I've actually studied a lot more of history because of this, and I try to put myself in those uh, shoes of those who've gone through so much throughout our history, and it makes me really think about how much we have today and how different times are. One of the fascinating aspects of Titanic's maiden voyage revolves around her female passengers. Edwardian etiquette had strict gender roles and divisions, and yet the Titanic's passenger list is filled with women who defied those conventions. Here was Denver socialite Margaret Brown, destined to be known as the unsinkable Molly Brown. She fought for women's suffrage, the rights of workers, and better education for children, and she even ran for Senate in 1914, in a time when American women weren't even guaranteed the right to vote. Here was found the young Madeline Astor, who had defied social conventions to marry the love of her life, millionaire J.J. Astor. Here was Lady Lucille Duff Gordon, the owner of Lucille Limited, a fashion and design firm that was all the rage on two continents, running her own business in a time when society told women their place was in the home and nowhere else. Here was Helen Candy, a celebrated author who had first shot to fame with a book entitled How Women May Earn a Living. The implied subtitle was, On Their Own. The women aboard Titanic were representative of a future where Edwardian conventions would come crashing down. Meals served to first-class passengers in 1912 were served in courses, and the final meal served aboard the Titanic was no exception. And for me, it was more when the music was playing, like during dinner, we were exchanging pleasantries that like I kind of lost myself. I'm like, oh, we're just like talking about their husband in Canada or whatever. And it just kind of went from there. Okay, guys, wait a minute. I, I have an idea. Okay, when my timer goes off, I think we need to go ahead and not only put ice in the glasses, but put the first round of iced tea in the glasses. So all you guys have to do is top off. What do you think? Okay, come on. We got this. Girl team. Led by teacher Amy Mount, these remarkable educators have taken the final menu from the night of April 14th, 1912, and with a few minor adjustments, are serving that menu to the students aboard the recreated Titanic. Eight courses will be served throughout the night, ranging from a mint sorbet to a vegetable marrow farsi. Okay. So I, at first I was kind of freaked out by the vegetable marrow thing, and like I wasn't sure what it was. I'm like, <laughs> to be honest, I'm still not sure what the vegetable marrow farsi is. So I ate everything mindlessly. <laughs> I even tried coffee, and I I, and I, I hated I hate it. The but I was it's like, disgusting. These courses are served by teachers standing in for the multitude of servants aboard the Titanic in 1912, trained to be out of sight and mind. They would, by and large continue in that role in the centuries since the Titanic sank below the waves. Few films or books focus on their plight, or that most of them never made it off the ship. The students, role-playing as first-class passengers, found it difficult to interact with the serving staff as Edwardians would have found proper. Well, I felt bad for them because they were being so nice, but you couldn't say thank you, or like even smile at them. They're like, just don't do anything. And they were just being so nice. I had to stop myself from saying thank you. That sounds like a weird thing to do, but I have been taught ever since oh. I was little, you have to be so polite to wait staff, and whenever you're given food, you have to say thank you. But then in etiquette class, they're just like, you can remember a staff thank you, but other than that, you're not supposed to notice them. And so I had to like stop myself from like asking them how they were and saying thank you. And I was like, my mother would be so not proud of not me right bad. now. <laughs> Even the teachers portraying the serving staff would walk away from the night with a greater appreciation 
for a forgotten chapter of the Titanic story. Did you notice us at all? Like as we're coming around and feeding and did you take notice that? Did you have any thoughts about the wait staff? No. No, I didn't notice them at all. I definitely noticed it more because I was hungrier than anything. So like y'all would be walking around I'm like, okay, okay, you can get here now, okay. And it's just like, it, I found myself like looking around for y'all and looking to ring the bell for the next course. I'm like, where's the more food? Okay, let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, asparagus salad with watercress and vinegar. I put some of the serving trays around just so that y'all could see oh. how heavy they were. Because, so it was common practice, as you guys kind of probably realized, oh to serve gosh. yourself off of a serving tray. Then you start holding that in this position while someone's taking their chicken off the plate. Like very slowly, and you're like, just take, take the, the chicken, chicken off. <laughs> I thought you were being forceful. You're like, please take two. His name was J. Bruce Ismay, and he was the chairman and managing director of White Star Line. His father had built the company, but it was Ismay who had made the leap that had put White Star on the map. Instead of focusing on speed, his vessels would focus on luxury, providing a passage that was a destination experience in and of itself. It is like a floating palace, is it not? How do you think the experience or the immersion might have been different if we had been not first class? Nowadays, that the ticket for a first class would be hundreds of thousands of dollars in today's money. And unless you're really, really famous, you can't afford that. Like none of us would be able to afford it. So I feel like is really humbling, but like also if I had done it as a third class passenger, you would have known you're not going to get an eight course meal. The Titanic was the ultimate expression of Ismay's business plan, and he was proud of her and what she stood for. Our world's best. Equally proud of the massive vessel was Thomas Andrews, managing director of the Harlan and Wolf shipyard. So, you want to cross the pond? Any German tramp steamer will do. You want elegance, you want good company, you want a good ship, the Titanic is the way to go. As a shipbuilder, Andrews had served an unparalleled apprenticeship, working since the age of 16 in almost every capacity, from shipyard to draft hall. Andrews and eight others from Harlan and Wolf were aboard the Titanic as what was known as the Guarantee Group. They were the Titanic experts, and should problems arise on the maiden voyage, their job was to fix her. Ultimately, when a problem did arise, it was beyond fixing, but that would not mean that the members of the Guarantee Group wouldn't try. None of the nine would survive. Yet another shipbuilder was aboard that voyage. Johann Reuchlin worked for a company owned by J.P. Morgan, who also owned the White Star Line, and he was aboard to evaluate the Titanic and decide if his company should commission a vessel of her class from Harlan and Wolf. Despite being in the middle of the North Atlantic, Reuchlin kept in touch with his family. The technology that allowed Mr. Reuchlin to reach out to his family from the decks of an ocean liner mid-Atlantic was a novelty in 1912, the Marconi Wireless Telegraph. For a charge of 12 shillings and sixpence, around three dollars, passengers could send a message of up to 10 words crackling across the waves waiting friends and family. More business, I suppose. Always business. For shipbuilders like Reuchlin, Ismay, and Andrews, the Marconi represented more than just a convenience of the modern world. It represented a safety feature. Safety in our business, because when something goes wrong now, you can send a message instantly and be able to get help from ships nearby. They would have been well versed in the tale of White Star's Republic, a ship that was sinking and used the brand new wireless to call other ships to her aid. But they were able to save the people that were on board once again because of the Mark Hall. I like not to think of us. This ship is not so I think that we're quite Both Ismay as chairman and Andrews as shipbuilder would have been proud of the process they used to produce a practically unsinkable vessel. 
That's how you design ships. You assume she's going to sink, and then you prevent that from ever happening. That is Mr. Ismay's counsel there. That design philosophy had already been put to the test. The Olympic, Titanic's sister ship, had actually been rammed by a British warship, the Hawk, in 1911. It's the Olympic was struck by a naval battleship designed to hammer other ships. And the Olympic survived of its own power, continued 36 hours to land. Not one person was harmed because of the strength of our ships, of our vessels. It's more dangerous to walk out your front door and cross the street than it is to sail across the ocean of my ship. To Ismay and others, the Titanic's unsinkable nature was set in stone by the Olympics' run-in with the Hawk. For most of the passengers aboard that night, however, no proof was needed. Titanic was unsinkable. Well, hopefully the only ice that we'll see tonight is in our glasses right now. Cheers to that. The Titanic is unsinkable. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you've met the ship's second officer. This is Mr. Charles Lightoller. During dinner, the ship's second officer, Charles Lightoller, sought out Mr. Ismay to retrieve a wireless message that the White Star chairman had stuffed in his pocket. The message Lightoller retrieved from the SS Baltic warned of icebergs in the Titanic's path. Despite popular conception, the various ice warnings received by the ship's crew did result in actions to steer Titanic into safer waters. This morning we decided that we would go 10 miles further south. So again, every precaution is being taken. It's about a few pieces of ice. We've already changed paths. Nothing to concern ourselves. I'm serious. Throughout the night of April 14th, as the temperature dropped below freezing, various passengers pondered the danger ice and icebergs might have for the Titanic. Nothing to be concerned about. Change, the course has been changed. All is well. Uh, it's nothing to be alarmed about. Not about the Titanic. It's indestructible. Among the many mysteries of that April night was the location of a pair of binoculars intended for the lookouts in the crow's nest. Officer Lightoller, having been made aware of their disappearance as they left Southampton, had been searching for them ever since. As of the night of April 14th, he had searched without any luck. As dinner aboard the Titanic came to a close, many passengers may have encouraged their table mates to fill out a page in an interesting item that amounted to an Edwardian era fad, the confessional book. Asking questions such as, what is your perfect man? Or what is a secret that you keep? Confessionals were popular conversation starters among Titanic passengers. Lady Duff Gordon, in particular, liked to use her confessional as an icebreaker of sorts. Good evening, gentlemen. Like to join me in the smoking room? As dinner ends, the passengers segregate, just as they would have if they were in a mansion or hotel rather than on the seas. The men adjourn to the first-class smoking room, where women are not allowed. And I noticed that I lost myself because usually I'm an introvert. I don't like to talk to people that much. But then once we moved into the smoking room, my introvert was. How is uh, the latest novel coming? And that is where the money is traveling now. Well, it's a big fan of her. Me too. Trying to Gentlemen? give women the right to vote in Britain as well. So I'm fully with you. Yes. Yourself. You designed well, I've always wanted to go to church, so I went to India and I opened up a school there for girls. And so now I'm visiting New York to try to publish a book, and then after that I'm going to call to London. Mr. Williams is quite the professional tennis player. Yes, yes, yes. A champion. In fact, Mr. Futrell. Perhaps rivals my own Conan Doyle when it comes to mysteries. As they pass the time in idle amusements, they are unaware that somewhere out there in the darkness of the North Atlantic, an iceberg is drifting into Titanic's path. Dated safety measures, and so we've spoken with the officers and such, and so I feel confident in the safety of the ship. Now it's a good thing that we're on the safest ship in the world. The uh, ship is, is proving to be 
unsinkable as we knew. It only took them six days to put out that fire. But I put it out. Indeed. Ironically, it might not be ice that poses the biggest threat to Titanic's maiden voyage. A smoldering fire broke out in the bunker of Boiler Room 6. The fire raged throughout the voyage, unbeknownst to the passengers and most of the crew. Boiler fire in the cold room and put out. By that final night, supposedly the fire had been successfully put out, although no one can say for sure. Nor can they say precisely what the intense temperatures of the coal fire had done to weaken the steel bulkheads. Drama played a large role in the life of Renee Harris, who with her husband produced some of the finest plays in New York. She had suffered her own little drama on the night of April 14th, slipping on a staircase and breaking her arm. Did you visit the ship's physician? Oh, I did, and that's where I this. Oh. Is it very painful? Maybe she'd be well, but yeah, it was very painful. The night the Titanic sank, an impromptu choir session broke out amongst passengers. Hallelujah. White Star Line began to include a warning to all passengers on her Atlantic voyages. The attention of the managers has been called to the fact that certain persons, believed to be professional gamblers, are in the habit of traveling to and fro in Atlantic steamships. There were indeed professional card sharps aboard the Titanic, traveling under assumed names. Ah! Mr. Ismay's luck has run out tonight. All of them managed to survive the sinking. How are we doing on our speed? Cold. I had to shovel into the boiler. That was going faster than I would like. However, I think we'll get safely to New York tomorrow night and confound everyone that's expecting us Tuesday morning. She'll we're be in the not, papers, Mr. Ismay. She'll be in the papers. Are we the most luxurious, comfortable, beautiful, or also the fastest? When she hits the iceberg, she will be going 22.3 knots. It is 11.39 p.m on the night of April 14th, 1912. The passengers of the RMS Titanic are either asleep or winding down their evenings. Few will hear the faint ringing of a ship's bell. The lookouts in the crow's nest have spotted something in the darkness, something darker than the night sky. An iceberg, dead ahead. Unbeknownst to passengers, ship's officers frantically try to turn the ship and avoid a collision. Less than a minute later, they realized their attempts were unsuccessful. Nothing. Let's finish the hand, gentlemen. What was that scraping noise? Like, I lost my sense of modernness whenever we first heard the iceberg hit and all that screeching. I was like, whoa. <laughs> and then I felt weird, because I felt like dizzy and stuff, because I felt like I was actually on a boat. Few aboard pay much attention to the sound of the iceberg tearing open Titanic's hull. Some feel the vibrations. Others don't notice anything at all. For the passengers of the Titanic, this is not yet a night to remember. Some passengers, however, notice that an ever-present noise has slowed and stopped. I'm gonna take a turn around the ship. The Titanic's mighty turbines have ceased to turn. If passengers ask, their concerns are dismissed. Some explain away the rattle and vibration as a result of a thrown propeller blade. Perhaps, perhaps there was a propeller that may have been thrown. This has happened already previously on the Olympic. Mm -hmm. 
ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing to be concerned about. Just a uh, light tap or light spray on some ice. Some passengers are more cautious than others. Yes. JJ Astor puts his wife Madeline in a life jacket almost immediately. Um, here I am, and we've all been told to come here and wait. Even though it's so inconvenient, I've retired to my stateroom. Unsinkable. We are in the unsinkable ship of the sea. I assure you, there's nothing to worry about. Everything is fine. Please, please don't care. You know, just stay calm. Stay calm. Even alerted, few passengers notice another ring or the crow's nest bell. A signal to the bridge the ship has been sighted less than 10 miles away. Many crew members believe the presence of this ship makes the situation far less severe than it actually is and count on it arriving to rescue the Titanic's passengers before the ship sinks. The ship never arrives. Her identity, even her existence, has been hotly debated ever since. The ship is unsinkable. No Something worries. serious has happened to the Titanic. The ship's engines are shut down, but the steam in the boilers remains, building up with no release. The ship's engineers let off the steam and signal to the passengers that something truly wrong has happened. Ladies, what can I do to assure you? I promise you can go back to... What's that? What's that noise? What's that noise? What's that noise? It's not water. It's not water. Um, the moment that was the most immersive for me was probably when we could hear the steam, the steam of the boat, and everyone was like, oh, it's fine, no need to worry, but we were like kind of freaking out because it felt like I was actually freaking out. So that was like, really eye-opening. When I lost my sense of modernness was when we were trying to figure out what hit the Titanic and when we were going to sink and all that stuff because we were all trying to figure it out and it actually felt like I was trying to figure out what happened even though I knew what was happening. <laughs> I didn't hear you. People were hiding stuff. And we didn't know if we were going to be prepared to fast. Most likely, certainly, a front propeller blow. This has happened already oh on the Olympics. <laughs> Prior to this voyage, of nothing to worry about. No major problem. Please, please. Uh, like about halfway in, I forgot that I was not myself. Uh, well, I mean, I forgot that I was John and not John the Troll. The government has to have 16, but on the Titanic, we have more than that. Oh, I'm getting home. I'm sorry, because there's no at a conference during the design stage of the Titanic in 1910, J. Bruce Ismay had been presented with a plan to equip the ship with 48 lifeboats, capable of carrying 2,886 passengers. Ismay studied the plan for a few minutes and rejected it due to the expense. Titanic sailed with the 16 lifeboats required by the Board of Trade, plus four collapsible boats. They could carry, at most, 1,200 people. No, ma'am. Uh, Nothing to fear or panic about at the moment, so no need to even consider like that. Thomas Andrews had almost immediately gone to inspect the damage to the ship. He understood what he was seeing and communicated that to Ismay and the ship's officers. The first six 
Titanic 16 watertight compartments had been opened to the sea in the 10 seconds it took the iceberg to scrape by. There's no stopping it. What are you saying, Mr. Andrews? Ladies, please. In an hour, maybe less, all of this will be at the bottom of the Atlantic. It's a mathematical certainty. Mr. time. I need all women and children to come with me. Women and children, please. Women and children. Women and children. The damage spelled disaster to those who could not find a seat in a lifeboat. This would include many of the men aboard who were faced with an Edwardian dilemma, should they even attempt to save themselves while so many women and children were in harm's way. If I have a chance to save myself in a way that's not going to put someone else out of their life kind of a thing, I mean, you know, I'll take it. And personally, I think that most people would. I will make myself comfortable. The gentleman made for us good advice. You want to see the women off? The right taller. The boat deck is put in on it. Gentlemen, if you want to lose, you'll we'll see if it's going to be like this one. Well, I knew that when my character was actually on the Titanic, she was with her sister, and she made her sister go in the lifeboat instead of her. And so I was thinking about, like, I have two younger brothers, so I was thinking about what if that actually happened? And, like, I know that I would have to let them go. But, like, it would be really hard to leave my family, you know? Richard Williams, his father was on board? Did he get off? No, and in fact, this is, this is something I, I've not told anyone. He watches his father die. He, the, his father is crushed by the first funnel, and he barely makes it out. And I'm just thinking, wow, I, I don't have to live through that, but I have to live knowing I'm the person who had to live through that. Save guess, yourself. J. Bruce is May would, after helping load and launch the lifeboats, save himself and step into a lowering boat. In doing so, he was not depriving anyone of a seat, but he would, regardless, be viewed as the villain of the Titanic story in 1912, and even now, over a century later. The Titanic is unsinkable. Others, like Thomas Andrews and Johann Reuchlin, would make no effort to save themselves. The Titanic slipped beneath the waves shortly before 3 a.m. on the morning of April 15, 1912. She had been carrying 2,207 passengers and crew. 705 survived. A night to remember, author Walter Lord called it. For the students participating as passengers, it was indeed that. A night to remember, followed, in most cases, by a morning to reflect. Another celebrated author, writing about Titanic, said, It was a truly terrible thing that happened, through no deserving fault of their own, to a group of basically good people. It is, in short, a tale in which everyone can find some point of experience, great or small, to which they can relate on a personal level. A night to remember. Walter Lord was right. The Titanic's last voyage has entranced generations since. For these students and their teachers, the night of April 14, 1912, lived once more. In many ways, the Titanic's final voyage never ended. She's still sailing out there, somewhere, in our imaginations.